In over 200 years of American history, these are the only presidents who have been elected to and served at least two full terms thus far. There aren't too many people more closely associated with the United States and its first president who served from 1789 to 1797. Before the U.S. emerged into its fully-fledged existence, George Washington had already built himself a reputation by way of his military service during the French and Indian War. He was also well known as a wealthy Virginian landowner, but he made his mark on history during the Revolutionary War as the commander-in-chief of the colonial army. He was a charismatic leader, if not necessarily the most tactically minded, but that was ultimately enough to help ensure victory. In the years following the Revolution, Washington looked to retire to private life, but the political scene wouldn't quite allow that. Given the respect he commanded from members of opposing parties, he was unanimously voted in as the first president. He did what he could to promote unity and earn respect for the country on the world stage. There was a demand for him to stick around for a third term, but he declined, instead choosing to live out the rest of his life at his home at Mount Vernon. Thomas Jefferson is another early two-termer who was well known for what he accomplished outside of his time as president, which lasted from 1801 to 1809. The Declaration of Independence is probably his biggest claim to fame, though it's far from his only impact on American history. Before his time as president, Jefferson managed to stir up a fair bit of controversy, mainly as part of the heated debates between the Federalist and Democratic Republican parties. And then there were his diplomatic dealings with France, particularly the Louisiana Purchase, which forever changed the balance of power in North America. But then he also made some shaky economic decisions as the Napoleonic Wars roiled Europe. While Jefferson was perhaps best known for writing the Declaration of Independence, his presidential successor, James Madison, was largely considered the father of the Constitution, as well as one of the major proponents of the Bill of Rights. Madison's two terms in office, which lasted from 1809 to 1817, were heavily affected by international relations. He effectively inherited the issues surrounding the United States' stance on the conflict between Britain and France from his predecessor. In the course of dealing with these problems, he found his administration at odds with Britain. With British ships seizing American ships and sailors, tensions continued to rise, eventually resulting in the War of 1812. Public perception of Madison and his actions during the war varied greatly. The start was markedly rocky, with opponents painting him as a weak pacifist while the military struggled. Furthermore, the image of British troops laying waste to Washington, D.C. as the president fled wasn't one that inspired much hope. Nonetheless, fortunes improved by the war's end, and an American victory also improved Madison's public image, making him a rather beloved and respected public figure. There are typically a few different lenses through which the fifth president James Monroe's time in office is viewed, a period that lasted from 1817 to 1825. The most fanciful is the era of good feelings, in which the American public rather literally felt good. Friction between political parties had reached a low point, and European politics had relatively little effect on American soil. However, that's not to say that the era of good feelings was without its problems. For example, the year 1820 saw the passage of the Missouri Compromise, a piece of legislation meant to deal with the issue of enslavement in states newly admitted to the Union. To put it simply, it was a divisive decision and just one of the many clashes that would ultimately lead to the Civil War. Then there was the Monroe Doctrine, a proclamation that essentially named North and South America as the United States' sphere of influence. The doctrine was written mainly by Monroe's Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. But because it happens in Monroe's administration, it's known as the Monroe Doctrine. The U.S. would stay out of European affairs, and in return, European nations would temper their colonial tendencies. It was a fairly common view of American politicians at the time, but it's had a rather complicated legacy since then. In the early 20th century, it was cited as justification for the U.S. intervening in the affairs of its neighbors, which those neighbors often didn't want. Andrew Jackson has become a controversial historical figure in today's politically charged climate. Before becoming the seventh president, serving from 1829 to 1837, he was a popular and well-respected war hero thanks to his military prowess during the War of 1812. But there are also plenty of blemishes on Jackson's legacy. For one, there was a depression that hit in 1837, the last year of his presidency. Though the official panic really started in May 1837 after Jackson left office, it's no stretch to say that his financial policies directly led to the bubble bursting early in Martin Van Buren's term. But the more infamous of Jackson's policies is undoubtedly the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Native American people were forced off their homeland so that those lands could be used instead by white settlers. That led to the Trail of Tears, in which thousands of Native Americans were forced to travel westward, a harrowing journey that resulted in thousands of deaths. 
The 18th President of the United States is probably more famous for his military service than his political career. After all, Ulysses S. Grant was the general in command of the Union armies during the Civil War, and he was known for his innovation and flexibility as a leader. His tenure as president from 1869 to 1877 is remembered in a considerably different light, though not necessarily due to his own faults. It was the era of Reconstruction, and the former Confederate states were reinstated to the Union. Grant met the problems of this time with an eye toward peace, as he often demonstrated clemency when needed. At the same time, he also did what he could to keep in mind the hardships of black Americans. The 15th Amendment was ratified during his administration, and various other acts were also put in place that were meant to keep black voters safe from harassment. However, the efficacy of those attempts is up for debate. Then there are the much less positive things that the Grant administration is remembered for. Despite the president himself trying to combat federal corruption, it still ran rampant. The financial panic known as the Black Friday of 1869 happened because of attempts to influence the gold markets, and a Grant appointee, General John McDonald, was implicated in a scandal known as the Whiskey Ring. Grant pardoned McDonald in 1877, further tarnishing his reputation. Usually, when a president serves two terms in office, one term immediately succeeds the next. But then there's Grover Cleveland, who holds the distinction of being both the 22nd and 24th presidents. And the historical oddities don't end there. When he lost re-election to Benjamin Harrison, he actually won the popular vote by a margin of about 100,000, only to lose the electoral college vote. But there's more than just strange trivia to know about this president. Before Cleveland's first term, which began in 1885, he was best known for using his power to strike down acts of Congress that seemed excessive or unnecessary. It earned him the popular image of being an honest politician that the average citizen could trust. Unfortunately, that particular tactic didn't serve quite as well during his second term, which lasted from 1893 to 1897. A depression hit early on, and Cleveland's insistence that the problems would solve themselves and that the government should do nothing to help the lives of people who were suffering earned him the ire of the public. Combined with his apparent willingness to work with the robber barons of the day, Cleveland's second term wasn't exactly the most impressive in American history. Wartime presidents tend to be among the most influential in American history. That's certainly true in the case of our 28th president, Woodrow Wilson, who served from 1913 to 1921, which overlapped with the duration of World War I. However, the first few years of Wilson's presidency were more heavily marked by legislation designed for domestic purposes. Many of the acts passed had to do with business practices and standards regarding working conditions. This included forbidding child labor and establishing an eight-hour workday and the Federal Trade Commission. In eight years, Wilson undid any and all federal progress achieved in race relations, including promoting the Ku Klux Klan as a force of good, seriously. For all of his big ideals, he is such a narrow-hearted little man. Wilson's popularity rose during the war, first for keeping the U.S. out of the conflict at its onset, and then for being an effective leader when it joined the side of the Allies. However, Wilson's most notable achievement came after the war's end in the form of the League of Nations. He even won the Nobel Peace Prize, though the U.S. ultimately didn't even join the League. With the organization often incapable of enforcing any decisions, it was largely ruled a failure, while the general principle was eventually resurrected in the form of the United Nations. Franklin D. Roosevelt led the United States through quite a tumultuous time, as he served as president during much of the Great Depression and World War II. He also holds the distinction of being elected to the highest office in the country more than anybody else. He bucked tradition and was elected for four terms, and he died early in the fourth term, and thereby served from 1933 to 1945. Roosevelt arrived in the office with the mighty promises of his New Deal, and he delivered in the form of various acts and federal organizations aimed at creating new jobs and providing relief for economic hardship. While the economic policies didn't actually stimulate growth as anticipated, Roosevelt's cheery personality and positivity kept the people firmly on his side. Like most economic struggles, the one thing that really got America going was, unfortunately, a war. Despite isolationism being the predominant ideology of the time, Roosevelt passed legislation that allowed the U.S. to aid Britain and France through financial and material means. Japan's attacks on Pearl Harbor in December 1941 then led to the American entrance into the war in earnest. Dwight D. Eisenhower was an extraordinarily popular president during his terms from 1953 to 1961. It was an era that could be summed up best by his catchy campaign slogan, I like Ike. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike for president. Eisenhower came from an extensive military background as he rose to prominence when he was appointed Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force during World War II. Perhaps most notably, he ordered the launch of the Normandy Invasion, also known as D-Day. Immediately after the end of the war, he was also put in charge of organizing the military forces for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. 
A lot of that success seemed to be attributable to Eisenhower simply being personable and thus easy to work with. He was so likable that he was eventually approached by both the Democrat and Republican parties to run for president. He would ultimately run on the Republican ticket, and he endeared himself to the public with his relatable demeanor and hobbies. Eisenhower's administration was largely concerned with the rising Cold War tensions. That included plenty of international travel and discussions with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. Other efforts included brokering peace at the end of the Korean War and the aptly named Eisenhower Doctrine, which promised American support to Middle Eastern countries fighting against communism. And then there was also the creation of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, better known as NASA, as a response to the Soviet launch of the Sputnik satellite. It's not too much of a stretch to say that Ronald Reagan's decades-long acting career shaped his political persona. It certainly made him popular among his supporters, as he came off as affable and charismatic. Quite a bit happened during Reagan's two terms in office from 1981 to 1989. Perhaps most notably, there was the fall of the Soviet Union, befitting the president's stance as a staunch anti-communist. Strained relations between the U.S. and the USSR were only worsened as Reagan increased the military budget and pitched his strategic defense initiative popularly known as Star Wars. But over time, the arrival of a more moderate Soviet leader in the form of Mikhail Gorbachev led to increased talks and decreased tensions, including genuine arms reductions. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Reagan's time in office certainly wasn't free of scandal, though. Most notably, during the Iran-Contra affair, members of his administration were found to be supplying arms to countries that supported terrorism, as well as funds to Nicaraguan insurgents known as Contras. American politics can be terribly divisive, even on the best of days. Looking back on it now, Bill Clinton's 1993 through 2001 terms were perhaps the last to feature a candidate in the middle, or at least close to the middle. His 1992 campaign was a masterclass on how to appeal to the everyman, and his 1996 re-election platform put him as the guy against all politicians on both sides, a perfect centrist. He won fans on both sides of the aisle. In terms of domestic policy, Clinton's administration oversaw the passage of legislation regarding the environment, education, and women's safety. Appropriately enough, then, the cabinet included multiple women and people of color. Furthermore, the economy enjoyed steady historic growth during this time. On the international stage, Clinton oversaw an agreement between Israel and Palestine in an attempt to broker peace. But Clinton's time in office certainly wasn't without its faults. Don't Ask, Don't Tell, for example, was a weak compromise regarding the LGBTQ community in the military that ultimately satisfied nobody. And of course, there was perhaps the most infamous presidential scandal in American history, Clinton's affair with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. He was impeached for perjury as he was accused of lying about the nature of their relationship while under oath, though he was eventually acquitted. Despite that infamous moment, Clinton has managed to remain a fairly popular ex-president, even with the taint of that and other scandals. I am bulletproof. The nature of many presidencies tends to be colored by the larger issues happening on the world stage at the time, and that's definitely true when it comes to George W. Bush. Following a very close and controversial election in 2000, Bush entered the Oval Office shortly before one of the most tragically influential events of recent history. Terrorists attacked American soil on September 11, 2001. Bush's policies during his two terms, from 2001 to 2009, were thoroughly influenced by what was dubbed the War on Terrorism, which included a heavy increase in domestic security. Those measures were both bold and controversial. For example, the National Security Agency was secretly given the ability to casually surveil phone calls and emails of everyday American citizens. This was a rather uncomfortable breach of privacy that Bush's administration worked hard to justify. Both the CIA and administrators at the new prison in Guantanamo Bay were accused of utilizing torture during interrogations. They were also accused of violating the Geneva Convention standards for humanitarian treatment during wartime. The war on terror is generally what Bush is best recalled for, but he did initiate two very large tax cuts for Americans, and his Medicare overhaul led to more Americans getting treatment from doctors. If anything, George W. Bush is more popular now than when he left office in 2009. Lasting from 2009 to 2017, the two terms of the first black president of the United States were marked by significant tension, though Barack Obama himself remains fairly popular. On the international stage, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan continued. The military presence ended in the former, though it actually increased in the latter to combat the rising threat to the Taliban. And while terrorism persisted, Obama's administration did see a major victory on that front. The 2011 assassination of al-Qaeda leader and 9-11 mastermind Osama bin Laden. If you doubt America's commitment, or mine, to see that justice is done, just ask Osama bin Laden. Perhaps Obama's most pressing domestic issue was the Great Recession, which was met with a large stimulus package as well as sweeping financial reform. Improvements came, though slowly and unevenly. 
and drew criticism both for the lack of speed as well as the cost amidst the growing national debt. But the domestic policy Obama is perhaps best known for is his healthcare reform efforts, built around the idea that healthcare is a right rather than a privilege. The Affordable Care Act, popularly known as Obamacare, was signed into law in 2010, though its opponents criticized it for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was the hefty cost. Political divisions were an unfortunately regular theme during Obama's tenure, as there were fights over all sorts of issues, including health care, gun control, and the national debt. The federal government was even shut down briefly in October 2013. Obama has since expressed regrets over not being able to do anything about all of this partisanship, especially as divisions have only grown sharper in the years since.